Commission. Last week we began in Matthew 28 and 16 through 20, and we saw this great mission that Jesus had for his disciples. And we learned last week uh, from Matthew 28, 16 through 20, that if we're going to fulfill our mission of making disciples, then we have to believe that it's our personal responsibility to fulfill the mission. No one is going to fulfill the mission unless they believe that it's their personal responsibility to fulfill the mission. And I have an image up there, if you put it up for me, the first image. It's a picture of two young ladies that are sitting somewhere discussing the work. Do we have that? Okay. That are sitting, and one of them has her Bible, and she is talking with the other young lady. And I, I saw that picture, and I thought, this is how easy it is. One person discipling another person, helping that person come to a knowledge of Jesus Christ or helping that one person uh, grow in their spiritual life. And uh, so anyway, uh, so if we're going to, uh, there it is, if we're going to fulfill our mission to make disciples, we have got to come to a point of believing that it is our personal responsibility. We learned, we saw last week from uh, a recent survey that was done by the Barna Group in 2018 that 36 percent of evangelical Christians don't believe that it's their personal responsibility to make disciples for Jesus Christ. And in 1993, that same survey was done, and nine out of 10, 90 percent believed that it was our responsibility. Only 10 percent believed that it wasn't. And so the church has seen a decline, a shift in its in its membership as far as believing that this responsibility for making disciples is actually mine individually. And so we saw in order to fulfill our mission, we have got to come to a point of believing, yes, it is my personal responsibility to make disciples for Jesus Christ. Or else also another graph, you put up that graph, this one here, well, that's awful small, isn't it? I'm sorry you can't see it. And uh, so it's not very large, but what it shows is what can happen with just one person discipling one other person per, per year. And I think you get the idea by the graph, is that you see how the kingdom grows from just one person in seven generations. So imagine what would happen if all of us would begin to disciple one person a year. And that person that we discipled went out and discipled one more, and we went out and discipled another person. Imagine what would happen in just a, a few generations uh, with this happening. The growth of the kingdom of God. God saw in his strategic plan that the best way for the kingdom of Jesus to grow was through multiplication rather than just through addition. This morning, I want to talk to you about another important aspect of Mission Impossible fulfilling our mission to make disciples for Jesus Christ. And what I want to talk to you about this morning is that uh, mission impossible will cost me. Mission impossible will cost me. And I want to tell you a, a story. And the story is found in Matthew, the 16th chapter. But before I tell you that story, I want to give you a, a little bit of background to the story. Thank you. I needed help remembering the story from, didn't that sound like, I'm looking up. Okay, I'm just going to tell you the background from the Matthew. I'm not going to tell you the background from Luke, Mark, and John, but here's the background in, that Matthew recorded. Jesus called his first disciples in Matthew the fourth chapter he called he called Andrew he called Peter he called James and John he called Matthew to be his disciples that's what we have uh, recorded well in Matthew 5 you began what is known as the Sermon on the Mount and in that sermon 
where Jesus was sitting on a mountain and he called his disciples to come and be with him on that mountain. And he opened his mouth and he began to speak to them. In that, in that particular sermon, which is the longest recorded sermon of Jesus that we have in the scriptures, Jesus says something to them that I believe shocked them. I believe it stunned them when he told them this. I, I, believe, I don't think they expected this. I mean, there was a number of things in there that he said, I think, shocked them. But this one in particular, I believe, really shocked them. Remember in Matthew 4, he said, follow me and I'll make you a fisher of men? Well, you get to Matthew 5, and he tells them, after he gives them what is known as the Beatitudes, uh, you're going to be persecuted. You're going to be persecuted for following me, is what he told them. And he gives them some, some promises about persecution. Well, if you'll fast forward with me, as he walked with those disciples over time, he, he became more specific about the persecution that they were going to experience. For example, he told them that they were going to be rejected by members of their own family. He said to them, I didn't really come to bring peace to your family, I came to bring a sword. And then he told them that they were going to be rejected by their own families for being his disciples. And then, not at the same time, it was later, he told them, look, uh, not only are you going to uh, be rejected by your own families, but you're, go you're going to be reviled for being my disciple. You're going to be reviled. People are going to make false accusations about you, and people are going to call you names. Remember he said to his disciples, you know, if they've called the master be Beelzebub, they're also going to call the servants Beelzebub. So basically he was telling them, you can expect to be called Satan if you follow me. You're going to be reviled for following me. And then he told the disciples a little bit later, we come to, you know, the 10th chapter of Matthew. And in Matthew 10, it's like he laid out a whole gamut of, of things they could expect to experience for being his disciples. And he told them they were going to be arrested and brought before governors. And not only were they going to be arrested and brought before governors, but he told them that they were going to be uh, scourged for being his disciple. And so there's this progressive revelation of persecution that Jesus gives his disciples from the beginning of the time that he called them to be his disciples to the very end. It's like he almost was saying, you know what? You can expect to be persecuted. If that's not bad, let me tell you. Your families are going to reject you. If that's not bad, let me tell you. You're going to be called names. You're going to be reviled. If that's not bad, you're going to be arrested, brought before governors, and you're going to be scourged. Well, as he gets toward the end of his journey here on earth, that brings us to today's story. And today's story is Matthew 16 and 21 through 27. Now, most of the ministry of Jesus took place in an area of Israel that's called Galilee. There was a big lake there. They called it a sea, and it's a beautiful lake. It's a beautiful, it's a beautiful body of water. And so his home base for his ministry was in a small town called Capernaum, which is on the north shore of the Sea of Galilee. And most of his ministry took place around the Sea of Galilee. But he would go up to Jerusalem, the city of Jerusalem, and he made visits to the city of Jerusalem. He never lived there. But he made visits during the three and a half years that he was carrying out his ministry. He made numerous visits to the city of Jerusalem. And so in Matthew 16, in verse 21, 
Jesus knows he's getting ready to leave Galilee and make his last visit to Jerusalem. It's going to be his last visit because Jesus knows that when he gets to Jerusalem, that he's going to be arrested by Jewish authorities. The chief priest and the scribes and the Pharisees are going to arrest him while he's there. And he's going to be tried. He knows this. He knows this ahead of time. And he knows that he's going to be executed. He's going to be killed. And so Jesus, in, in Matthew 16, 21, tells his disciples what to expect. This is what's going to happen to me. I'm going to go up to Jerusalem. I'm going to be arrested by the chief priests, the Pharisees, and the scribes. And then I'm going to be executed. I'm going to be killed. Well, this did not set well with his apostles, his, his disciples, the 12 disciples. It didn't set well with them. That's not what they were expecting. You see, what they were expecting was a messianic leader who would be a descendant of David, which Jesus was, and he was going to come and he was going to equip them, he was going to enable them to overcome Roman suppression, and he was going to then secure the leadership of all of the nation of Israel and lead the nation of Israel to be the most powerful nation upon the earth. That's what his disciples fully expected. And the reason they expected that was that's what the prophets said was going to happen. And so they had every reason to believe that that was the Messiah that Jesus was going to be. Messiah means Savior. He was going to save them from Roman oppression and elevate the nation to its place of prominence that it held many years before when King David was the king of Israel. That's what they expected. But as he got close to the end of his life here on earth, he was preparing them to understand his, his mission that he was accomplishing with this visit to the earth. And of course, we know it was to die for the sins of the world, that the sins of mankind could be forgiven so that each person would have the opportunity to go to heaven when we die rather than be judged by God for our sins. Now, we understood this. We understand this. They did not understand this. And so they were offended when Jesus said, look, this is what's going to happen to me in Jerusalem. And so Peter, being the spokesman of those disciples, he says to Jesus, he rebukes Jesus, Basically, he says, you're wrong, Jesus. He's, he basically says, you know, how can you say these things, Jesus, are going to happen to you? And so Peter and the rest of the disciples are offended. Well, Jesus understands that Peter is being inspired by Satan. And so Jesus says to Peter, Get thee behind me, Satan, for you're not mindful of the things of God, you're mindful of the things of men. <laughs> Whew, man. And then Jesus said this to his disciples. He said, If any man would come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross, and follow me. For any man will save his life, he will lose it. But if any man will lose his life for my sake, he will find it. For what will it profit a man if he gains the whole world and forfeits his soul? And what will a man give in exchange for his soul? But the Son of Man will come with his angels in the glory of the Father, and he will reward every man according to his works. You know, uh, 
When I look at this story, and I look at the background to the story, I ask the question, how does what Jesus told his disciples relate to me? I mean, I'm 63 years old, and I've been a Christian for 46 of the 63 years. And when I was a young Christian, I remember reading these kind of stories in the Gospels about persecution and what the disciples were going you know, to have to face, what the disciples were going to have to experience. And I, as I read those stories, I remember thinking, well, it's, it's going to really cost me to be a Christian. That's the way I related to these stories. I was just beginning my Christian journey as a young teenage young man, and I was thinking, wow, man, this is going to cost me to be a Christian. And then also, when I was a young Christian, I heard sermons on the cost of discipleship. And each time I heard a sermon on the cost of discipleship, I anticipated that at some point in time, in my own journey as a Christian, I would experience everything Jesus told his disciples they were going to experience. You're going to be persecuted. Your family's going to reject you. Uh, you're going to be brought before governors and rulers and tried and arrested and scourged. And then really what he told them in what we just read in Matthew, uh, the 16th chapter, is you're going to lose your life. And so here I was, a young Christian, and I would read these, these passages of Scripture, and, and I would hear a sermon on the cost of discipleship, and I would think, you know, I'm going to really have to suffer a whole lot for Jesus' sake. Well, here I am 46 years later, and... Uh, I cannot say that I have ever experienced what Jesus said his disciples would experience. I mean, maybe some of you can say, yeah, I've experienced those things in my life. 46 years later, I, I can't honestly say I've ever been persecuted for being a Christian, ever, in my whole life. So how do I relate to what Jesus said? I don't think I've ever suffered legitimate persecution the way Jesus talked about it to his disciples. I've never been reviled for being a Christian. I never experienced it the way he said his disciples were going to experience it. I've never been rejected by my family for being a Christian. In fact, my family likes me and loves me and accepts me. I've never been arrested and scourged for being a Christian. I haven't even been threatened with arrest, much less been arrested. I've never felt that my life was in jeopardy for being a Christian. I've never felt that. Like my life was really in danger because I'm a Christian. I've never felt that. You know, what I have suffered is I have suffered for being a human being. Uh, we all suffer for being a human being. The wages of sin is death, and death has more to do with physical death. It has more to do with other things as well as physical death. And so certainly I have suffered for being a human being, but those are things that everybody suffers. This kind of persecution or suffering that Jesus was talking about with his disciples, this cost they were going to have to pay, it was specifically related to them being his disciples. And I can't say that I have suffered any of these things legitimately. I would be misleading you if I said, oh man, I've really suffered like this. No, I, I haven't. You know, uh, there were other costs if we looked at some other stories that Jesus talked about to his disciples that I've also never experienced. At one point, a guy came up to Jesus that was one of his disciples and said, I'll follow you wherever you go. 
And Jesus responded to the question by saying, you know, the foxes have holes and the birds of the air have nests, but the Son of Man has nowhere to lay his head. Implying that if he followed Jesus, it was going to be a pretty difficult life. Well, (laughs) I've always had a place to lay my head. You know, even when I've gone on mission trips, you know, to New Guinea, Australia, Spain, Brazil, Mexico, Africa, when I've gone all these different places around the world on mission trips, I've always had a place to lay my head. And so I haven't suffered that. And then, you know, I've never missed a funeral of a loved one because I was a disciple of Jesus. And there was a guy that came up to Jesus and said, you know, uh, I want to be your disciple, but first let me go back and bury my father. And Jesus basically told him that the cost would be he wouldn't be there for the burial. So basically what he told him, that if you follow me, you're going to miss the burial of your father. I've never suffered that. I've been there for the death and funeral and memorial service of every one of my loved ones that I've wanted to be there for. Another guy came to him and he, he couched it in the terms of eternal life. What do you have to do to have eternal life? And basically, Jesus told him what he needed to do to be his disciple. He said he had to give up everything, go sell everything, give it to the poor, and then come and follow him. You know what? I've never had to give up everything I own and give it to the poor. Not one time have I ever done that. Now, some of you may have, but I've never done that. You know, I've heard some preachers say that to become a Christian... You must deny yourself, take up your cross, and follow Jesus. Have you ever heard that? That if you want to become a Christian, if you want to be saved, if you want to go to heaven when you die, you must deny yourself, take up your cross, and follow Jesus. I've heard heard preachers use these very verses to say that before you become a Christian, you better count the cost. Well, let me ask you a question. How could little Ellen count the cost that was baptized this morning? There's no way that she can relate to the cost of being a disciple of Jesus or counting the cost. The only cost that anyone had to pay for me to become a Christian is the cost that Jesus paid. I didn't have to pay any cost to become a Christian. I didn't have to tell him that I was going to pay some cost in order to become a Christian. And Jesus said in John 3, 16, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, That whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Where's the cost in that? To me, the cost is in what God paid in that verse. Paul said in Ephesians chapter 2 and verses 8 and 9, For by grace you are saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is a gift to God, not because of works, lest any man should boast. And so you see, when it comes to receiving Jesus and receiving salvation, There's not any cost to be paid, but the cost that he paid. And Jesus paid it all. And all we have to do is receive that by faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, that what he accomplished on the cross, he accomplished it for me. And as a result, my sins are forgiven. So I disagree. I disagree with those that would say that In order to become a Christian, you got to deny yourself, take up your cross, and follow Jesus. That's not the gospel we preach here. I've heard some preachers say that the cost of being a disciple of Jesus is the spiritual disciplines that you have to practice in your life, like having personal devotions and attending church services. Oh, wow, that's, that's an incredible cost, isn't it? Huh? That's an incredible cost, right? Having personal devotions. Man, that's denying yourself, taking up your cross and following Jesus, having your personal devotion. Are you kidding me? Because I have received the grace of God through Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of sins, I now have a relationship with God. Let me ask you something. If I asked you out to lunch and you said, I don't know, I don't know, you know, Pastor, that's really hard work going to lunch with you. 
Yeah. <laughs> oh, that's really hard work spending time with you, Pastor. I don't know if I can pay that cost or not. And some preachers preach that the spiritual disciplines are the cost of discipleship. The spiritual disciplines are now privileges that we get to enter into because we are now the children of God. Oh, I've got to go worship God this morning at church. That's such a tremendous cost. Oh, my goodness. I'm denying myself, taking up my cross and following Jesus by having my quiet time. I'm denying myself and taking up my cross and following Jesus by... By coming to church. Are you joking? Really? You really consider that to be a cost? I I mean, I consider that to be a privilege. I get to be with God every morning. You know? I get to walk with God. I get to come and worship with you guys. Man, that's not a cost. So I disagree with that. I consider the spiritual disciplines to be spiritual delights. Because I am a child of God, I get to meet with God and pray and read His Word. I get to worship with God's people. I don't consider this to be a cost to me. I've heard some preachers say that the cost of being a disciple of Jesus is giving up sin. Have you ever heard that one before? Well, you just need to give up sin. You just need to give up sin. In order to give up sin, you got to deny yourself, take up your cross, and follow Jesus. you got to give up sin. Now, come on. It's, it costs to give up sin? Think about that for just a moment. It's a blessing to give up sin, not a cost. I'm the one that gets the benefits from giving up sin. See, I've lived in sin. I know the cost of sin. And I want you to know, it's like, it'd be like me saying to you, you know what? You need to, here's the cost of discipleship. You need to give up cancer. What? That's a cost? No, it'd be a blessing to give up cancer, right? And I want you to know, sin is like an infectious disease that destroys your soul. And it destroys, destroys your mind. And it destroys your emotions. I want you to know, it is a privilege and a blessing to give up sin. It's not a cost to give up sin. Oh, I'm just really dying for Jesus. I can't curse anymore. I just, I'm just really paying the price for Jesus. I can't commit sexual immorality anymore. Oh, I've got to give up drunkenness. Oh, my goodness. I've got to stop being a substance abuser that's addicted, that's losing my family and losing my money all the time. Oh, that's such a tremendous price to follow Jesus. I don't agree with that either. I don't think giving up sin is a cost of discipleship. In fact, it's just the opposite. I have found that it costs me to live in sin. And it's a blessing not to live in sin. So that's not, that's not the way it applies to me. So I look at what Jesus said to his disciples, what we just went over briefly this morning through this story and the background I gave you. And I ask the question, how does what Jesus told his disciples relate to me? Where, where, where is the cost for me? And here's what I want you to get this morning. The cost is in the mission. It's always in the mission. I want to say it again. The cost is in the mission. Do you get it? The cost is in the mission. That's where the cost is. And that's how I can relate to what Jesus said to his disciples. And I can honestly say, yes, it does cost me to be on mission for Jesus Christ. To make disciples of Jesus, yes. 
I have to deny myself and take up my cross and follow him. I have to do that. That's where the cost is. If I'm not on mission for Jesus, I don't, there is no cost. It doesn't cost me anything. <laughs> it's in the mission. Denying myself and taking up my cross means giving up my time for the mission. It means giving up my money for the mission. It means giving up my home for the mission. It means giving up my friendships for the mission. That's the cost. That's the only way I can relate to what Jesus said to his disciples. They had to do those things too, right? They had to give up their time. They had to give up their money. They had to give up their home. They had to give up their friendships to make disciples for Jesus. And I have to do the same thing, and so do you. Discipleship cost. Now, personally, how it's working in my life as of today is that right now, I'm personally discipling 13 men to be disciples of Jesus. I want you to get an idea of what that looks like, discipling 13 different men to be disciples of Jesus. And I want you to understand this. My goal with each one of these men is to see them make disciples that make disciples. I'm not interested in self-help. I'm not interested in behavior modification. With every man that I meet with to make disciples, my goal is to see them that's my ultimate go, turn around and make disciples themselves. For me personally right now, it requires seven scheduled meetings each week to get with all of these men. So every week I have seven scheduled meetings to get with all of these men. And one of the reasons why it takes seven is they cannot all meet together at the same time. If they could all get together at the same time, it'd be a lot easier. But it's not. They can't all get together. So it takes seven scheduled meetings each week to get with all these men. Each meeting that I have with these men is centered around God's Word and what's going on in their lives and how the Word of God applies to what's going on in their lives. Each meeting lasts between one to one and one and a half hours. And of these 13 men, there's six of them that I meet with every week, twice a week. And I'm in contact with nine of the 13 men every day by phone or by text, every day. I've already communicated with them this morning. So it costs to make disciples, and this is what it costs me. It costs me my time, it costs me my money, it costs me my home, it costs me my friendships. These 13 men have become good friends with me. But the truth is, I'd rather go play golf with Steve, even though I hate golf. <laughs> I mean, Steve is so much fun to be with. I would choose Steve to be my best friend that I spent all of my time with outside of my family time because he's such a fun guy to be around. Some of you are real bummers. You're more like me, you know. <laughs> I probably wouldn't choose you. But I would choose Steve because he's so much fun to be around, you know? And so it costs friendships. Not that people are rejecting me, but I, if I'm spending time with these guys, I can't spend time with other people that I'd really like to spend more time with, you know? And they're all different personalities, just like the disciples of Jesus were. I mean, some of our personalities don't match. Some of them annoy me. Because our personalities are so different. And so I have to give up friendships. I have to give up time in order to do what I'm doing. Like I said, my ultimate goal in each and every meeting or conversation is to equip these men to disciple others. That's it. I, do I serve them? Yes. If they get sick and go in the hospital, do I go see them? Absolutely, whether they attend here or not, it doesn't matter. 
This is not something I do because I'm a pastor. This is something I do because I'm a Christian. You get that? This is something that God has called us to do as Christians. When I meet with these men, I don't preach at them like I preach at you. That's my job as a pastor. I preach once a week. I don't preach at these men. I live life with them. I share life with them. I engage life with them, and they engage it with me. But the ultimate goal and the ultimate end is I want them to become men who make disciples the way I have taught them, by the way I've modeled discipleship for them. That's what I want to see happen. And you know what? It's working. I can say this, as I said on August the 12th, for the first time in my ministry, it's really, really working. Because now I can see up to five generations that started with me. Where I disciple somebody, now they, they disciple somebody, then they disciple somebody, and then that fourth generation is discipling others. I've never seen that happen before, ever, in my life as a pastor. And that's just one tree. But I'm hoping to see 13 more trees from the guys that I'm currently working with and discipling. You know, what I found out about this, as far as the cost, is that it takes a razor-sharp focus on this. You know, this is not something that I can do as a hobby. You know... It, it's not the same as marriage, the responsibility of marriage, but it's pretty close. I mean, it's pretty close. I mean, my responsibility to my wife is, you know, a lot different from my responsibility to these guys. But at the same time, I have to have a razor-sharp focus in, in order for it to happen. A whole lot of the time that I'm spending doing this is in my free time. In other words, it's not my 40 hours a week that I'm devoting to be a pastor. It's my free time. I rarely miss a meeting. I rarely miss a meeting with these guys. And if I do miss a meeting, I do everything I can to reschedule it. You know, I... Uh, if I was not discipling these men, I do not think I could relate to what Jesus said about the cost of discipleship at all. I mean, whatever I would come up with, like I talked about earlier, giving up sin, spiritual disciplines, I don't even think I could relate at all if I wasn't discipling these men. Well, why do I do this and why should we do this? This part of the mission called Mission Impossible in our series. Well, first of all, we learned last week that I, it's our responsibility. It's my responsibility to disciple others who will disciple others. Second reason I do it is I love Jesus. I love Jesus more than I love anything. And that's not because of something that I've worked to earn. It's something that He's made possible by revealing himself to me through his mercy and grace. And as a result of his mercy and grace and the forgiveness of sins, I've fallen in love with Jesus. And so I do it because I love Jesus. And because I love Jesus, I want to see his kingdom grow and expand. And as I said earlier, I believe this is the fastest way to see his kingdom grow. Not by addition, but by reproduction. And then another reason I do it is I love people. And once again, this is not something, I, I used to hate people. I would put on a face like I liked them, but I didn't really, I hated them. And, you know, I was always trying to distance myself from people and isolate myself from people. You know, oh, there's another person, you know, and that's the way it was. But after I received Jesus, all of a sudden I began to love people because Jesus lives in me. And so I, lo I do it because I love people. And then I do it because I find my meaning in life when I'm discipling others. I find my meaning in my existence right now in life for when I am discipling others. Jesus told his disciples they would find life, you know. 
He said to them, you know, uh, he who seeks to save his life shall lose it, but he who loses his life for my sake shall find it. And one of the aspects of that word life is meaning in life. And the truth is, I have a hard time at times calling this a sacrifice because I find such meaning in it. Discipling others. And I never know the outcome. You know, discipling people is like, it's like trying to herd a bunch of cats. I mean, it are unpre- the cats are unpredictable, right? Dogs are more predictable in most cases. But, you know, to try to lead a bunch of cats is like, I never know what the results are going to be when I'm discipling anybody. And so I don't really find my meaning in life from the results. I like to see the results, but I find my meaning in life from this being the purpose of my life, the reason I exist until I breathe my last breath. Jesus said they would find their life. You know, since the fall of man, mankind has searched for the meaning of life, and this search has led many people to adopt a cause to live for. And certainly that's true in this millennial generation. Boy, they're adopting all kinds of causes to live for. The cause that Jesus wanted his disciples to adopt was his mission. That's what he wanted them to adopt as their purpose for their existence, knowing that was the best way to bring him glory. How can I bring Jesus glory if I'm not fulfilling his mission that he has for me. And he promised them if they sacrificed their life for his mission, they would find meaning in life. They would find life itself in him. And I want you to know it's true. I mean, it's so true in me that the words of Jesus are true. And then another reason I do it is because I believe I will be rewarded by Jesus when he comes. That's what he said to his disciples in this passage that we just read. He not only told them they would find life, he told them that he would reward every man according to his works when he comes. And so what it tells me is what I'm doing is not going unnoticed by him. That's what it tells me. And I'm going to be rewarded. You know, since the fall of man, mankind has searched for wealth, thinking that being rewarded with wealth was going to be what would really make uh, their lives beneficial. And so the search for wealth, it's, it's, I mean, historically, there's all kinds of stories that we could read about people searching for wealth in this world. The wealth that Jesus said his disciples would receive was his reward. That's the wealth. His reward. He promised them if they, would, if they sacrificed their life for the souls of men, they would receive his reward when he comes. You know, I, I don't know what that's going to be even. But I know it's better than money. I know that. I know it's going to be incredible. Can you imagine God giving you a reward? I mean, if you've been, you know, if... I know most of you have had people celebrate your birthday, and that's a reward when they do that. And that feels pretty good most of the time, you know, when they celebrate your birthday, especially if they make you the right kind of cake. But can you imagine God rewarding you? Now, the Scripture is really clear about what we're going to do with any rewards we receive. We're going to just toss them at the feet of Jesus because worthy is the Lamb was slain to receive glory and honor and power and praise. And we know that, you know, I wouldn't be doing any of this if it wasn't apart from Jesus and what he accomplished for me when he died for me on the cross. I wouldn't be doing any of this. His reward, it motivates me, knowing that's going to happen at some point. No matter what results I see in this life, there's going to be a reward. You know, there's one decision that I did make as a youth that has been of great benefit to making disciples and, and the cost of discipleship. And <clears throat> I decided that I would be willing to die to make disciples. Now, I don't know exactly when that happened after I received Christ, but there was some time in there when I heard a sermon and I heard these verses of Scripture that, you know, you heard this morning and the story that I told you this morning. I heard that. And, and, the, and whoever it was, you know, brought me to a decision of, would you be willing to die to fulfill your mission? 
for Jesus Christ. And I understood the mission was to make disciples. And I said at some point, yes, if it costs me my life, if it costs me my life, I will. And I made that kind of, I prayed that prayer unto the Lord. Now, why was it important for me to give up my life to make disciples? Well, I got that from the life of Jesus. Remember, we're following him. And here's what happens. I told you last week I was going to talk to you about fear. You say, when are you going to get to it right now? Jesus did not fear losing lesser things in this world because he was willing to die to fulfill his mission. <laughs> Jesus did not fear losing lesser things in this world because he was willing to die to fulfill his mission. Jesus knew that if his disciples were willing to die to fulfill their mission, they would overcome the fear of losing lesser things. In other words, when you put your life out there and you're willing to give up your life, what does your money matter? What does your house matter? What do relationships with others matter? You know, once you're willing to give up your life, when you're willing to die to fulfill your mission, you will overcome the fear of losing the things of this world. Now, there's all kinds of examples of that. One of them is the man that started the Protestant Reformation at a time when Protestants were not popular. His name was Martin Luther. And Martin Luther had come before God once he discovered the truth that salvation was by faith in Jesus Christ and not by works as the Roman Catholic Church was teaching. And he was standing against this incredible, incredible uh, wrong theology in the church at that time. And he was hated. But he came to a place where he was willing to give his very life to make disciples of Jesus Christ. Martin Luther, Luther King Jr. did the same thing for the civil rights movement. Martin Luther King Jr. would have never did what he did unless he was willing to sacrifice his life for the cause that he believed in. And what it did for him is what it does for any human being. It helps us as human beings be willing to lay down lesser things if we've made that commitment that we're willing to sacrifice our life for the cause. My nephew, Matt Mills, was a Navy SEAL who was killed in Afghanistan along with numerous other Navy SEALs, part of SEAL Team 6. You know, Matt didn't fear anything it looked like. But one of the reasons why he had resolved that fear overcame that fear, might be the better way of saying it, is that he already made a decision to sacrifice his life to fulfill his mission, if that's what was necessary. And so you get the point. Once you make this commitment that I'm willing to sacrifice my life to accomplish the mission of Jesus Christ, you don't fear losing lesser things. You overcome the fear of losing lesser things. These disciples of Jesus that Jesus gave this story to, they accomplished their mission. Every apostle of Jesus was martyred except, well, two that were in this story. Judas Iscariot, who betrayed Jesus, and then John the apostle. He was greatly persecuted, but tradition tells us that he was not martyred, but all of the others were. What Jesus told them was going to happen, happened to them. They fulfilled their mission because they were willing to die to fulfill their mission. You know, these disciples, as I've said, suffered to fulfill their mission in, in ways that I've never known and probably never will know during the course of my lifetime. I'm humbled as I read the book, Fox's Book of Martyrs, for example. Read that book. That humbles me. I've, I'll never experience that as far as I know. Your generation might here in America. I don't know. But I won't ever experience that in my lifetime more than likely. I'm humbled as I read what those disciples gave up to make disciples and fulfill their mission. But what I do know is this. What Jesus told his disciples still applies to me and you. To make disciples, I must give up my life. I must, and that means give up my time. I must give up my money, my home, my friendships. And if I'm willing to die to make disciples of Jesus, I will give up these 
lesser things in this world to fulfill my mission. The question is, am I willing? Am I willing? And the question is, are you willing? Are you willing to take on this mission? Here's the mission if you choose to accept it. Are you willing to give up your life, your time, your money, whatever God requires of you to make disciples for Jesus Christ? Now, I said this last week, and I'm going to say it again this morning. When you're being like Jesus, yeah, there's a price to pay. But when you're being like Jesus, you're being the best version of yourself. When you're being like Jesus, you're being the best version of yourself. You're being who God created you to be when you're being like Jesus. And I want you to understand something. When you're being like Jesus and you're being that best version of yourself, you experience the fruit of the Spirit in your soul. And it's incredible. It's amazing. Pray with me this morning if you would. Here's the commitment. Lord Jesus, I will sacrifice my life for your kingdom. I will sacrifice my life for your kingdom. And I want you to understand as you make this commitment that it's not a one-time commitment. In fact, Jesus taught his disciples to take up their cross daily. In Luke uh, 9.23, Jesus taught his disciples to pray, Thy kingdom come, thy will be done. And he was teaching them to pray daily in their lives. Paul said, I die daily. In other words, if you make this commitment, I'm willing to die to fulfill the mission that you have for me to make disciples for your kingdom. It's something that you need to keep in front of you, keep before you. Would you pray, Lord Jesus, I will sacrifice my life daily for your kingdom. Thank you, Father, for what you're doing in our hearts and in our midst. Thank you for your word. Thank you for the life that you've given us. What a great life you've given us to walk with you and live in relationship with you, God. Thank you, Father, for loving us the way that you do. And thank you for making this life possible. Thank you, Lord, for making our lives count. Thank you, Lord, for making our lives count. This morning we're going to finish with a time of prayer as we always do. And many of you may have already heard the news about Wayne Larimore having cancer. And it's very serious, very serious. And so I'm going to ask for someone to come and stand in for the Larimore family this morning. Uh, if you're not new with us, they used to be members of our church here and for many, many years. And they're dear to our hearts. So if you come on up, Paul and Ben, and they'll be praying for the Larimore families. I, I communicate. Both of them have already been out to see them at their house. And uh, I communicated with them that we would be praying for them this morning. They know what that's all about. If you have a need for prayer, whatever it might be, it may be related to this sermon. It may be related to something else that's going on in your life that you need prayer for. This is a time for us to pray with you about it. And our people are ministers. And they want to come and pray with you, whatever your need might be. And here's the way you can identify that you have a need for prayer. You just come up like Leroy is here or these people are here. Just come on up if you would. And when you come on up, others are going to come and join you in prayer and pray with you about your needs. So let's stand together right now. If you have a need for prayer, would you come on up? And as the Lord leads, would you come up and join these who have already come? But don't leave here today without having your need prayed for. If you've got a need for prayer, come on up. Stand to the right or the left or right here or right here, and I'll make sure. They'll, people will see you, and they'll come. That's just who we are. Come on up if you need prayer. And I confess, bowing here, I find.